Pull out your message notes. Time Magazine has said that today we live in an age of FOMO, F-O-M-O, stands for fear of missing out. And about 70% of millennial generation, because they're on social media a lot, say they struggle with FOMO, the fear of missing out. And in a desire to keep up with everybody, uh, people have overbooked their calendars, overspent their money, overdrawn their credit, overloaded their emotions, overworked their bodies, overcrowded their days, and overvalued the approval of other people. And as a result, you may feel overstressed, overanxious, and overwhelmed. Now why do people do this? Why, why do we do overkill? It's the fear of missing out. Uh, they don't want to fear, feel inferior or inadequate or unloved or left out. Today I want us to look at the subject of moving from being overwhelmed to overflowing. From overwhelmed to overflowing. And Tom and I want to share with you an important message that really could change your life if you'll apply the points of it. I want to begin by explaining two different fundamentally different approaches to life. You can approach life with a shortage mindset or you can approach life with a surplus mindset. Big, big difference. A shortage mindset, if you might write this down, means I never have enough and I never will. I'll never have enough and I never will. That's gonna leave you feeling overwhelmed. I don't have enough time, I don't have enough money, I don't have enough energy, I don't have enough contacts, opportunities, knowledge, education, or whatever. It's the feeling that you're always a little bit short and a day late. That causes you to feel overwhelmed by life. In the Bible, words like lacking, wanting, uh, needing uh, are, are used for this lifestyle, this shortage mindset. Good examples in the Bible, there was a famine in Israel, and uh, Elijah and his servant Gehazi had a discussion about this. And notice up here uh, on the screen, the Bible says, a man brought Elisha, the prophet, some loaves of bread. Now remember, this is a famine going on in the land. Elisha said, give it to the people so they can eat. And Elisha's servant said, there's not enough here for 100 people. Not enough. That's a shortage mindset, shortage mentality. Just give it to them, Elisha said. The Lord has promised there'll be more than enough. That's a surplus mindset. So the servant gave the bread to the people, and sure enough, it says they ate until they were full, and they still had some left over just as God had promised. Shortage lifestyle, I'm never going to have enough. Surplus lifestyle, I've got more than enough. Now, the focus, if you want to write this down, the focus of a shortage mindset is I focus on my limited resources. My limited resources. I look at all the things that I'm lacking. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough energy. And the result of a shortage mindset is an overwhelmed life. I just feel so overwhelmed by everything that's going on in my life. I just am always behind. I, I, I'm always in competition. When you have a shortage lifestyle, you think that life is like a pie, and if somebody takes a bigger piece, that means a smaller piece for you. That there's a limited number of resources, and if they get more, then you're gonna get resentful. Are you gonna get worried? Are you gonna get anxious? Because there's only so much of the pie to go around. That's a shortage mentality. And it leads to envy, it leads to jealousy, it leads to resentment, it leads to worry, it leads to insecurity. If you have any of those things in your life, you're living on a shortage mentality, that there's not enough to go around, and if you get more, then I should resent it. Now instead, God wants you to have this other kind of lifestyle, which is the, the surplus mentality. And the surplus mentality is this, write this down. God has more than I'll ever need, and he'll never run out. God doesn't give us one pie, he's a pie factory. And there'll always be more pies because God will keep creating them. And in the Bible we have words like abundance and plentiful and abounding and bountiful. God has more than enough to meet all your needs and everybody else's needs at the same time. Well, let me give you an example. Have you ever worried that the person breathing next to you was stealing your air? <laughs> no, <laughs> of course not. Why? Because God created more than enough air for everybody to have plenty of air. All you need and everybody else can have all they need too. Now, 
the result or the focus of a surplus mindset is instead of focusing on my limited resources, I focus on God's limitless resources. That changes everything. God's unlimited, limitless resources. And he's got plenty, and the result is an overflowing life. Now, with that understanding, we can go to where we're gonna go today in Psalm 23. We've been studying the Lord is my shepherd psalm now for many, many weeks. And we come to the next phrase where David says, you fill my cup to overflowing. You fill my cup to overflowing. ICB translation says, you give me more than I can hold. The New English, or the New International Version says, my cup overflows. And if you memorize this years ago in the old King James, you memorize it, my cup runneth over. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the overflowing life rather than the overwhelmed life. Now I want you to compare, we've been in this psalm for a long time, it's only six verses. In verse one he says, the Lord's my shepherd, I have everything I need. He, has, he gives me everything I need, I shall not want. Now in verse five he says, my cup runs over. He's taking it to the next step. Verse one, God gives me everything I need. Verse five, God gives me more than I need. My cup runs over. I, I can't keep it all. My cup runs over. He gives me more than I need. Now, what's your cup? What's the metaphor here? Write this down. My cup is my life. When, when David says, my cup runs over, he's saying, my life is overflowing. I'm not overwhelmed anymore because I don't have enough time, energy, or whatever, but instead I'm overflowing. There's like a river coming out of me. My cup overflows. Jesus talked about this. In, in John chapter seven, Jesus, 2,000 years after David, said this. On the last day of the festival, it's the most important day, this is at the temple in Jerusalem, uh, Jesus stood up and he shouted to the crowds. Now there's probably 50,000 people on the last day of the festival, outside the temple, 50,000. Imagine the drama of this. Jesus Christ stands up and he shouts to the people. And what he shouts is this. If you are thirsty, come to me. And everybody's looking around. If you're thirsty, come to me. Everyone who really believes in me will have rivers of living water flowing out of their lives. What's he talking about there? He's talking about the same thing David's talking about. My cup runs over. My life is not overwhelmed. My life is overflowing. I'm not worried about running short of anything because God is the source of my life. He can turn on one faucet and turn off another. I can lose one job, he can turn on another. When the faucet runs out of water, I don't think, oh, there's no more water in the world. I just get a new faucet. Here is an overflowing life. And he says, anybody who believes in me, really believes in me, will have rivers of living water flowing out of their lives, living an overflowing life. Now he says there, who believes in me. Circle that phrase, really believes. That word in Greek is the word pistuo. And it actually means more than just having head knowledge, like I, I believe Jesus is the son of God, it means to trust in. It means to cling to. It means to rely on. It means to depend on. He says, if you really, really, really depend on me, your life's not gonna be overwhelmed. Your life's going to be overflowing. He said, well, okay, fine. What is an overflowing life? Let me give you a definition, write this down. An overflowing life means to be filled beyond capacity. To be filled beyond capacity with an endless supply of God's goodness. That's what I want in your life as your pastor, somebody who loves you, as your spiritual coach. I want you to be filled beyond capacity, it's overflowing, with an endless supply of God's goodness in your life. That is what an overflowing life's all about. Now the, the, this illustration, this example, this metaphor, that the cup is your life, my cup overflows, the Bible uses this all through scripture. And it talks about having a cup of joy, having a cup of blessing, God's blessing, having a cup of hope, having a cup of peace, having a cup of salvation, 
He said, I want your life to overflow with joy and hope and blessing and salvation. Why? Because God is a good God. Now remember, we've been in this series for now 10 weeks, and we've been looking at how good God really is. And I want you to write this sentence down, okay? And if you really get it, it'll change your life. Because God is good, because God is good, everything he does in my life is for my good. Anytime you doubt that, you're gonna get in trouble. Anytime you doubt God's goodness in your life, you're gonna get in trouble, you're gonna worry, you're gonna have all kinds of problems. Because God is good, everything he does in my life is good. Even the tough stuff he does in my life is for my good. Now there's lots of verses in the Bible that talk about this. In Isaiah chapter 48, it says this. I am the holy God who rescues you. For your own good, I teach you and I lead you along the right path. The reason we have the Bible with all these principles in it, he says, for your own good. For your own good, I teach you. I don't do this to make life tough or rough for you. I do it for your own good. I do it so you can live a good life, live a better life. He says, for your own good, I teach you and I lead you along the right path. Right path. And he says, how I wish, man, how I wish that you'd obeyed my commands, the ones I told you, thought that I led you in. How I wish you'd obey my commands. Then, listen, your success and your good fortune would have overflowed like the flooding river. Did you know that God wants you to succeed to an overflowing way? That God wants your life to overflow with good fortune and success? Everybody wants to be a success. Well, he says there, if you would have just observed the commands I gave you, your success and good fortune would have overflowed like a flooding river. Did you notice the key to success in life? It's not going to self-help seminar. It's not watching some TV show. He says, if you just do what I told you, if you just read the owner's manual, I did this for your good. If you just treat your body the way I tell you to treat it, it'd be for your own good. If you just treat sex the way I tell you, it'd be for your own good. If you would just treat money the way I tell you, it's for your own good. And every time you don't listen to me, you're just messing it up. You abuse and misuse and pervert the good gifts I've given you. Sex, money, energy, reputation, everything else you got. He goes, I want you to succeed in life. God is a good God. I have good plans for your life. He said, if you would just do what I tell you to do, you'd succeed in life. He said, well, I'd rather go on my own plan. How's that working out for you? Have you had the overflowing success in life that you thought you were gonna have? No. Has your life been overflowing with good fortune? No, why? Because he says, if you would just do it the way I told you. Now listen to this. Anytime I disobey God, God says, do it this way and I do it that way. At that moment, I'm doubting the goodness of God. That's the fundamental problem. Anytime God says, do it this way, I go, well, I think I know better. I think I know what will make me happy more than God does. In fact, I'll just be my own God. At that point, I am doubting the goodness of God. And anytime you doubt the goodness of God, you are making a fatal mistake, friend because God knows what'll make you happy more than you do. You don't even know what will make you happy. You think you do, and that's why we get off. When I think I know I'm gonna make myself happy by doing something different than God says to do, it causes all kinds of problems in my life. Stress, overstress, and overstrain, and overburdening, and overanxiety, and overwhelming, because I'm doing it my way. He says, look, I, I do this for your own good. I'm a parent who loves you. I'm their loving heavenly father. And anytime you disobey me, you're just saying, I don't trust your goodness, God. I really don't. I think no, what's good for me is more important than what you think is good for me. You know, 2,000 years later, Jesus said the same thing. John 10, verse 10, I love this in the Amplified. Notice a verse. Jesus said, I've come that you may have real life. That means we're not really living until we know him. 
We're just existing. And he says, and to enjoy it in abundance to the fullest until it overflows. Jesus says, that's what I want you to have. I want you to have a full life. I want you to have an abundant life. I want you to have an overflowing life. Now, how do I experience an overflowing life? Four daily habits. Write these down very quickly. If you'll do these, they will change your life. Here's the first habit for living an overflowing life and stop living an overwhelmed life. Number one, stay connected to Jesus every day. You gotta stay connected to Jesus every day. In John chapter 15, verse five, Jesus compares this to like a grapevine. And he says this, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you stay connected to me, you'll produce a lot of fruit. But you can't do anything without me. I grew up in Northern California in the wine country. Everybody had vineyards in their backyard. And every season I would harvest grapes and I learned something real quick. If a cluster of grapes happens to be on a branch that's been cut off, it dies. You can, you can tag on, you can tie on grapes to dead branches, but if they've been cut off from the root, cut off from the, from the, the vine, they're gonna die. And the same thing is true with you. If you try to go through life on your own power, you're gonna be overwhelmed. But if you're connected to the vine, if you're plugged into Jesus, you're gonna have power. I've told you this before, a toaster cannot fulfill its purpose unless it's plugged into the power. And a vacuum cleaner cannot fulfill its purpose unless it's plugged into the power. And you as a human being, as a woman, as a man, cannot fulfill your purpose unless you're plugged into the power. And if you're cut off like a grape branch from the vine, you're gonna shrivel up and die. You're gonna be overwhelmed. He says, you gotta stay connected. He says, you can do nothing without me. He said, I, I'm the energy, I'm the power. How do you stay connected? How do I stay connected to Jesus on a, on a daily basis? You, you spend some time with him. We talked about this in a previous message on, on uh, having a banquet in the Bible. That every day when you get up in the morning, you sit down, you read the Bible for a little bit, let God talk to you. You talk to God, that's called prayer. You listen, you be quiet, you spend some time. If you wanna have a relationship with anybody, you gotta spend time with them. You can't have a relationship with your husband or your wife or your best friend or God if you don't spend time with them. If you're not spending any time with God, you don't have a relationship with God. You have to have a relationship, you have to have proximity, and you have to have frequency. And the way you stay connected is to have that daily time alone with God, and then throughout the day, you just review it and you go back over it. Jesus continued about this in John 15, verse seven. He says this, if you stay connected to me and my words remain in you, you may ask, you may request, ask any request you like, that's in prayer, and it will be granted. Circle that, it will be granted. That's a promise. My true disciples produce much fruit. This brings glory to my Father. So stay connected. Stay connected to my love. He says you stay connected to my love when you obey me. I've told you this so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your cup of joy will overflow. There's that word. The overflowing life rather than overwhelmed life comes from being connected to God. That means you gotta spend time with him. Now, circle the phrase, my words remain in you. He says, if you stay connected to me, you spend some time with me every day, and my word stays connected to you. How do you do that? There's a word for that in the Bible. It's called the word meditation. Now, when I say the word meditation, I'm not talking about what most of you are thinking of. You're thinking about sitting in a lotus position with your hands out like this, and you're going, um, and contemplating the lint in your navel or whatever. No, 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 that's Eastern meditation. Okay, that's new age meditation. Meditation simply means seriously thinking about God's word, what God has said. You get a verse, you read it, and you think about it over and over and over. Question, how many of you know how to worry? Can I see your hands? All right, if you know how to worry, you are already a pro at meditation. 
When you take a negative subject and you go over and over and over it in your mind, that's called worry. When you take a verse from the Bible and you go over and over it in your mind, that's called meditation. So if you are good at worrying, you're gonna be great at meditation. You're already, some of you are professional meditators and don't even know it. Instead of taking a worry or a fear or an anxiety and thinking about it over and over and over, how am I gonna do that, which leads to overwhelming, you take a verse from the Bible and you think about it over and over and over and that leads to overflowing. Big, big difference. One takes you down, one builds you up. He says, if you, you let my word remind, remain in you, he, notice the promise. He says, I will, you may ask any request you like and it will be granted. Whoa, that's like a blank check for prayer. You say, well, wait a minute, Rick. I'm not seeing this in my life. I pray a lot and I don't see a lot of answers. Because you're not connected. When was the last time you spent an extended period of time just alone with God? Saying, hey God, is there anything you want to tell me? When was the last time you were alone with God for more than two minutes? You're not connected. He says, you're, you, you've been cut off from the vine. You, and you, no way you're going to have any fruit in your life. You're not going to be overflowing. You're going to be overwhelming. Because you're not connected to me. The more connected you are, the more fruit you're going to bear, the more success in your life, the more good fortune, God says, you're going to have in your life. you got to stay connected to me. It's, it's a simple principle. But it's one that we overlook over and over and over. Now let me give you a second key. Each of these steps get a little bit harder. Here's the second key to overflowing. The first is stay connected on a daily basis to God, to Jesus. Number two, stop griping and start being grateful. Stop griping, stop grumbling, and start being grateful. Did you know that science has proven that each of these attitudes, uh, actually that the Bible talks about, are good and bad for your health? That, that complaining is a very, very unhealthy emotion for you. Griping is unhealthy for you. But gratitude, study after study of study have shown, gratitude is the healthiest emotion. You wanna be healthy? Learn gratitude. When you are grateful, it changes the chemistry of your brain. Studies have shown that when you are thankful, when you're grateful, it produces serotonin in your brain, it produces dopamine in your brain, and it produces oxytocin in your brain. Now don't confuse, that's not oxycontin. <laughs> oxytocin is the feel-good hormone. When a husband and wife make love, it releases oxytocin in both of their lives. When a mother nurses her baby, it releases oxytocin in both the mom and the infant. Studies have shown that if you pet a dog or a pet for 30 minutes, you pet the dog for 30 minutes, it releases oxytocin in the dog and in you. You want this drug. You want this hormone. You want this chemical in your life. And one of the key things that's produced for, for smarts, for peace, and for happiness, those chemicals, dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, happen every time you're grateful. So you ought to get up in the morning before you get out of bed, you make a list of 10 things you're grateful for. God, I'm grateful for air. God, I'm grateful for this bed. God, I'm grateful that I'm not in a war right now. God, I, and you just start, and that will change the chemistry in your brain. Study after study has proven this. In fact, one study showed that if you try to make a list of 10 things you're grateful for and you can't even think anything up, just thinking up, trying to think of things to be grateful for changes the brain chemistry in your mind. Even if you can't even think of anything. But just the attitude of trying to be grateful in your mind. Philippians 2.14 says this in the Bible. In everything you do, stay away from complaining and arguing. Hmm, because that's the exact, exact opposite of gratitude. Uh, let me ask you, what do you complain about? No, don't tell me. <laughs> Second thought, don't, don't tell me. Let me ask you this. When you complain about something, how, how does that help you? Does that work out pretty good? You claim, claim, complain about the weather, does it change the weather? You complain about the way you look, does that change the way you look? You complain about your spouse or your children or your job or anything else. Complaining is a total waste of time. It's doing without doing. It's worthless. 
You should stop complaining and start being grateful. Stop grumbling, stop griping, and start being grateful because you're not gonna feel better from complaining. Colossians 2, 7 says this. Let your lives overflow, there's that word, with thanksgiving for all God has done. I suggest that you start your day with gratitude for God, what God has done for you, and for others. And just go, go through that. In fact, did you know, I read a study recently, that if in the morning you get up and you, you send, the first thing you do is you send an email of gratitude to somebody you love or somebody who's helped you, it actually lowers your stress for the rest of the day because of the chemist, chemicals that are released in your mind. It'll actually lower your stress if you'll start your day with good news, not bad news. And if you actually start with gratitude, send a, an email a day. It'll help you be healthier. First Thessalonians 5.18, no matter what happens, always be thankful, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. You know, I have people come to me all the time and say, you know, Pastor Rick, um, I just want to know God's will. I just want to know, what does God want me to do in marriage? What does he want me to do in my career? What does he want me to do in school? What does he want me to do? I just want to know God's will. Well, here it is. This is God's will for you, that in everything you give thanks. Why would God teach you step two when you haven't done step one? You want to know God's will on who to marry. God's saying, why don't you start with step one? Are you being grateful in everything? That's my will. That is my will. God says, do step one, and then we'll move to step two, and then we'll move to step three, and then we'll move to step four. What is my will for you in every specific situation? But if you're not doing what I've already told you to do, why should I tell you step two? If I want to be living an overflowing life rather than an overwhelmed life, I first stay connected to Jesus. I make that a habit every day. I spend time. You can't get to know somebody you don't spend time with. And then number two, I stop griping and I start being grateful. All right, here's the third thing the Bible says to do. If you want to live an overwhelming life, an overflowing life, stop comparing and start being content. Stop comparing yourself to other people and start being content. Each of these gets a little bit harder. The Bible says any time I compare myself to anybody else that I'm foolish. It's a waste of energy. Anytime you compare, see, God made you to be you. He doesn't want you to be anybody else. When you compare, you get envious, you get resentful, and you often start trying to copy somebody else. Because, wait a minute, I, I made you to be you. If you don't be you, who's going to be you? God has never made a clone. Human beings make clones, God only makes originals. Even, in, even identical twins are different in thousands of ways. When you get to heaven, God isn't gonna say, why aren't you more like your sister? Or your mom, or your dad, or your brother? Or why aren't you more like some, some famous person? He goes, wait a minute, I made you to be you. If you're not gonna be you, God should just go ahead and kill you right now because we don't need two of anybody else. God wants you to be you. But comparing gets you in trouble. Look at this verse on the screen. Here's what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. We do not make the mistake of comparing ourselves with others because when we compare ourselves, we are foolish. I'm acting like a fool anytime I, I compare with anybody else. Now, there's two problems with comparing yourself to other people. And we do it all. We, you know, Americans, we've made this an indoor sport. You know, we, we compare how we look. We compare our careers. We compare our grade point average, we compare academic ability, we compare uh, our kids, we compare our spouses, shoot, we compare the green, how green the lawn is. Theirs is greener than our, our, our lawn. And, and, and that just always causes you to be overwhelmed, not overflowing. God says don't do it, it's foolish. And there are two reasons. One, you'll always find somebody in life who's doing a better job than you, and you're gonna get full of discouragement. Uh, they got more money, they've got more talent, they're better looking, and you get full of discouragement. Number two, you can always find somebody, you're doing a better job then, and you get full of pride. Pride and discouragement will also set you on the bench. 
They take you out of the game. In fact, you don't even get in the game when you're full of pride or ego or when you're full of discouragement uh, or resentment because of somebody else. Now, the Bible says stop comparing and start being more contented and you'll live an overflowing life. And yet today, it's easier than in any other time in human history to compare yourself to other people. Why? Two words, social media. It's right in your face every day. If you're on social media, you see, oh, look what they did. Oh, look what they're wearing. Shoot, we compare what we do, we compare what we wear. We even compare what we eat on social media. I just got a caramel macchiato frappuccino cappuccino. (laughs) Well, I don't have one of those. I better run out and take a picture too of mine. So I'm gonna go get the caramel macchiato frappuccino cappuccino Al Pacino. (laughs) Because that's the really exclusive one and you gotta know the owner to get that at Starbucks. Most people don't even know about the Al Pacino cappuccino frappuccino. But it's a good one and it makes me feel better because I posted it on Instagram, ha 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 ha. (laughs) And we do this all the time. It is so easy because of social media to get start, st- uh, stuck in staging your so-called pretend perfect life. Now everybody knows you don't have a perfect life. We know it, you know it, and you know everybody else doesn't. But on you know, social media, everybody's trying to put their best foot forward. And we're living for the approval of other people. Like, oh man, I haven't posted in a day. I better put something out there so people will think, I, it's the fear of missing out. FOMO. The fear of missing. I better get something out there, show how cool I am. And there's two downsides. I'm not saying social media, you should just leave it, but some of you should go on a social media fast to to break the addiction. You know, fasting's good for your body, gives your body a rest. Social media fasting is, is a good thing too because the truth is, that kind of always putting yourself in front of other people, it's your own little reality show. And it does two things. It feeds your narcissism. It's all about me, it's all about me. Look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, when a little kid, a three-year-old comes up to me and say, Papa, Papa, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's cute as a three-year-old. It sucks as a 30-year-old. Okay. Okay. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Look at me, look at me, look at me. And that's what you're doing on Instagram. And that's what you're doing on Twitter and Facebook. And Look at me, look at me. Come on, be a grown-up. It's okay as a baby, but not for everybody else. It creates narcissism in you, and it creates envy in everybody else. And by the way, you know what the worst, the worst is self-righteousness, showing off in a spiritual way. Like, Notice how I'm raising my hands in prayer, and my new sweater, too. <laughs> or, or see me highlighting my notes in my quiet time alone with God that I just shared with one million people. <laughs> if you're having a quiet time to impress other people on Instagram, stop it. That's the worst form of hypocrisy. And I, I'm showing how spiritual I am. It's the humble brag, like, you know, please pray for me. I've gotta go pray for Bono like putting in a little name dropping there or something. All of the, you know, you're, if you're a worship leader and all of, you know, you post the picture where all the lights make you look like a rock star. Don't. That's the overwhelming life. That's not the overflowing life. As I said, some of you need a social media fast. Look at this verse on the screen. 1 Corinthians chapter four, verse seven. Who says you're better than others? What do you have that was not given to you by God? Everything you've got is a gift of God's goodness. The air you're breathing right now, the heart that is beating right now is a gift of God's goodness. And if it wasn't given to you, why do you brag as if you didn't receive it as a gift? It's all a gift, folks. Let me ask a real serious question. You wanna be healthy? You wanna live longer? Look at the next verse. Proverbs 14, 30, the Bible says, it's healthy to be content, but envy will eat you up. 
And the more you go out there and you look at what other people are doing, the more envious you get, the more jealous you get, and the more resentful you get. He said, it will eat you up. Ecclesiastes 4, 6. It's better to be content with what you have than to always be struggling for moral, more. That's like chasing the wind. You know, in the New Testament, Paul says, I've learned to be content. It has to be learned. You see, by nature, I'm not a naturally contented person. Neither are you. By nature, you are not a naturally contented woman. You're not a naturally contented man. By nature, you are naturally discontented. And that creates a lot of overwhelmingness in your life. But if you listen and do what God says, you learn to be content, that's a good thing. You see, all those negative things that stress you out, worry, jealousy, resentment, anger, fear, insecurity, feeling unloved, feeling unworthy, feeling ashamed, feeling guilty, all those different things, guess what? They're all learned. Now anything you can learn, you can unlearn. And the stuff you need to learn, like learn to be content, is what life's all about. Learn to be unselfish. Learn to be grateful. Learn to connect to God every day of your life. He said that's gonna help you learn contentment. Get your eyes off other people. You know, the richest people in the world, I, I know a lot of people who are very rich. I, I probably know a dozen or so billionaires. And they would tell you themselves that there is no amount that will bring you at happiness because you always want just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And the, the, the wealthiest person in the world is not the one with the most money. The wealthiest person in the world is the one who's most contented with what they've got. Because you can have a ton of money and still be miserable. God says, I want you to stop griping and start being grateful. And I want you to stop comparing and start being contented. And then there's one more, and this one's the hardest of all. Stop being stingy and start being generous. If you wanna move from the overwhelmed lifestyle, I can't tell you how important this key is in your life. If you wanna move from being overwhelmed all the time to being overflowing all the time, you must move from being stingy to being generous. And I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about your time, generous with your energy, generous with your compliments. Stinginess is evidence of a shortage mentality. Stinginess is evidence of a shortage mindset. I only have enough, and, I, and if, if I give it away, I'm not gonna have enough for me. That's a shortage mentality. It means you don't trust the goodness of God. When you say, I can't afford to tithe, I can't afford to be generous with the guy on the street, I can't afford to, to give money away to other people, I need it all for me. You don't understand how the universe operates. Because God wired a universal law into the universe, and it's this. The more you give away, the more you're gonna get. And God wired the universe in that way that the more you give, the more you get. He did that because he wants you to become like him. God is a giver. The most generous being of all is God. Everything we have is a gift of God's generosity. And God wants you to learn to be like him, like father, like son, like father, like daughter. God so loved the world that he gave. Now you can give without loving, but you cannot love without getting. This really upsets some people. When you hit the stingy nerve in them, it just irritates them because they don't understand the universe is the more generous I am, the more God is gonna bless me in every single area of life. You're gonna overflow. When I'm afraid to give away, it means I'm living a shortage mentality. I'm not living a surplus mentality. It's like, well, if I, if I give away my piece of the pie, then, I, then you get more. No, that's not what it's about at all. Look at what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter nine. Remember this. A stingy planter will only reap a small crop. You know, I grow vegetables. I'm a farmer. Last year I grew 56 kinds of vegetables and 18 kinds of fruit. Now how about if I got a package of tomato seeds, I got a, well, I got 200 seeds this package. I'm only gonna plant one seed. Because I better, I better hold on to these, I might lose them. The only way I'm gonna benefit from these, I'll lose them if they keep them seed, they'll just die. But if I plant them in the ground, 
I'm going to get far more back than I planted. You plant one kernel of corn. Do you get back one kernel? No, you get back stalks of corn with thousands of kernels on them. You always get back more than you put out. He says, remember this, a stingy planter will only reap a small crop. But anyone who sows generously will also reap generously. So, each of you should give serious consideration to what you want to give God. He says, don't ever give emotionally. He says, think about it. Be rational. Give serious consideration to what you want to give God. Not reluctantly or under pressure, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, you've heard me say this many times. Never give under pressure. If anybody ever pressures you to give, don't give because you don't get any credit for it. If you felt pressured for me, don't give, because you don't get any credit for it. God loves a cheerful giver. You only get it when you, God doesn't need my money. God doesn't need your money. He's, got, he's, the, he's the source of all the supply. He wants what it represents, your heart. Do you trust him? Do you have a shortage mentality, or do you have a surplus mentality? Do I think, if I give away anything I've got, my energy, my time, if I give away compliments, maybe I won't get complimented. He says, you can be sure, here's the promise, that God is able to bless you with all grace so that in all things, at all times, you will always have all you need and you'll also overflow, that's the overflowing life, so that you can give to every good work. Good night, that's like seven alls. Let's circle them, okay? This is, this is a pretty... Cut and dried promise from God. Notice he says, God is able to bless you with all his grace. Circle that, all his grace. So that in all things, circle that, at all times, circle that, you will always, circle that, have all you need, circle that. You'll also overflow, that's circle that, so that you can give to every good work, circle that. That's a pretty amazing promise. He said, if you'll learn to be generous, with your time, if you learn to be generous with your money, that's the acid test of do you trust God? Do you have a shortage mentality or surplus mentality? Most of you know Kay and my testimony on this. 42 years ago when Kay and I got married, we started tithing. Uh, tithe means 10%. God says first 10% goes back to God. So we, when we are just really young, 42 years ago, we started giving 10%. I was only making like $200 a week. I was in school. And uh, so if we made $200, 20 bucks went to God. If we made $1,000, 100 bucks went to God. We said, we may be in debt to other people. We're not gonna be in debt to God, okay? Because we trust him. He's, gonna, he's our source, not us. He's not, we're not the faucet. He, he's the source. And at the end of our first year of marriage, we raised our giving to 11%. Nobody told us to do this. Doesn't even say in the Bible to do it. We just wanted to do it to be more generous. Second year of marriage, we raised our giving to 12%. Third year, we raised it to 13%. Now, we, we weren't bragging on this. We never told anybody about it for 30 years. and We weren't trying to show off. We just, I wanted to grow in generosity. Every time I give, it breaks the grip of materialism in my life. The antidote to get, 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 get is give, 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 get. Every time I give, my heart grows bigger. Every time I give, I become more loving. Every time I give, I become more like Jesus. And so every year, we just raise our giving. Now, some years I'm out of work or I'm in graduate school, where the cupboard is bare, we'd still raise our giving, quarter of a percent, because we wanted to be more generous the next year than we were the previous. Some years we've had a landfall. I, I'd get a job or get a raise or have a royalty or something and we'd raise our giving sometimes three or 4%. Most of you know that today, Kay and I give away 91% of our income and we live on nine. And I can't tell you what a joy that is. I don't take a salary from this church, you know that. I've served this church for free for, for 38 years. But I've trusted God, and I've played this game with God for 38 years, where God, or 42 years, where God says, Rick, you give to me, and I'll give to you, and we'll see who wins. <laughs> and I've lost that game for 42 years. You cannot outgive God. Most of you know I wrote that book, Purpose Driven Life, became the best selling book in the world for four years. Sold about 60 million copies in English, and then 
when in 138 language, it's the most tra- translated book in the world. It's in Guinness Book of World Records. He said, well, man, I'd, I'd, I'd give all my money away, millions away, if I made millions. No, you wouldn't, because you're not doing it now. I was doing it when I was making $200 a week. God knew that he could trust me with that money. He knew I wouldn't use it on myself. I'd just give it away. You cannot outgive God. I remember one time, uh, Kay and I took Matthew, you know, our son who had the mental health issues, took him up to Pasadena for counseling to a doctor, and Kay said, I'll go in with a doctor, and I said, well, I'm, I'm just gonna go get something to eat. So it's downtown Phil, uh, Pasadena, and I walked to a little burger shack, and I got a burger and some fries, something to drink, and I went over, and I, I sat down on the steps uh, of uh, an old church, a church downtown right, on, right off Colorado Boulevard, and I'm just sitting there on the steps starting to eat my lunch, and all of a sudden, I turn around and I realize there are three homeless people sitting on these same steps. So I look around and go, hey, would you guys like to share my lunch? What am I doing? I'm just trying to be generous. It's a simple thing. You guys want to share my lunch? Yeah. So I took my lunch and I divided it into four, the burger into four pieces and handed them there and handed each one an equal number of fries. I did not share my drink. <laughs> I didn't know what kind of disease they might be. Not on suck on my straw here, so... <laughs> But I shared all of that, and we had a good time. We just told a bunch of jokes, had a good time talking, having fun. And about 30 minutes later, I got up ready to leave, and I started walking away. One of the guy goes, I know who you are. And I go, how do you know who I am? He goes, you're Pastor Rick. I said, how do you know who I am? He said, because five years ago, on the other side of town, in Santa Monica, about 45, 50 minutes from here, he said, I was sitting outside a taco joint at midnight. And you were up at UCLA visiting somebody in the hospital and you'd gone out to get some meals and you you stopped and as you got out of the car you saw me sitting there by myself, kind of huddled and you go, hey, can I buy you lunch? Can I buy you dinner? And you brought me in, a total stranger, and bought me food and drink. He says, I've never forgotten that. Now what's the likelihood of me meeting the same Homeless guy, five years later, 50 minutes away, on the other side of L.A. As I walked away, I said, God, what are you doing here? He goes, I just want you to know, I notice. I notice the little stuff. And the more generous you are, the more I'm going to be generous with you. Have you ever wondered why you don't have enough? Do you remember the story of Daniel? We studied Daniel for about 12 weeks when God took the nation of Israel and they were taken captive in Babylon for 70 years. And then later God said, you can go back home, but he said this, here's the key. I want you to put me first in your time, in your life, in your money, in your day. And he goes, when you go back home, just to prove it, the first thing I want you to do is I want you to rebuild the temple, which was destroyed, which is a symbol that worship comes first. God comes first in my life. And all those people went back home to, uh, to Israel, and you know what they did? They forgot it. And they didn't put God first. They didn't build a temple. And there's a whole book in the Bible about this, mixed priorities. God says, if you put me first, I'll bless you. It's called the book of Haggai. Look up here on the screen. Here's what Haggai said. You know, you spend a lot of money, but you don't have much to show for it. You got food, but you don't have enough to fill you up. You have drink, but not enough to satisfy your thirst. You have clothes, but not enough to stay warm. You earn money, but it disappears as fast as if you had holes in your pocket. He said, in the income that you bring home, it, it just gets blown away. Consider, have you considered why this is happening? Because you're too busy building your own fine house that you haven't built my temple, the house of worship. And that's why I'm withholding your blessing. Whoa. We'll just let that one set there. Okay. Could this be the reason that, I don't ha- that I'm overwhelmed instead of overflowing? That I don't have enough? You ever read God's challenge verse of the Bible? I call it the Pepsi challenge verse. Look at this verse, Malachi 3.10. He says, bring your full tide to my storehouse so there will be food in my house. He's talking about where you worship. Test me in this. He says, I dare you. I dare you. Test me in this, says the Lord. And see if I won't open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it, read the word with me, overflows. That's the overflowing life. He says, I I dare you, 
Put me first in your time. See if I don't bless your time. Put me first in your relationship. See if I don't bless that. Put me first in your money. See if I don't bless that. Whatever you want God to bless, you put him first in. You trust Jesus. You say, well, I trust him to get me to heaven. Do you trust him for anything else? How much? We'll close with this verse here on the screen. Jesus says this. Words of Jesus. If you give, you will receive back. Your gift will be returned to you in full measure. Packed down. Shaking together. It's like when you're shaking a thing to get all the air out of it. Shaking to make room for more and running over. That phrase right there, running over, it's the same phrase as David in the Lord's in the Psalm 23. My cup runs over. It's the overflowing life. How do you get that life? He just says it. Whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it'll be used to measure whatever is given back to you. And finally, Jesus says this on the screen, Matthew 9, 29. According to your faith, it will be done to you. Let's bow our heads. Are you tired of being overwhelmed? Have you had a shortage mindset? And I won't have enough time. I won't have enough money. I won't have enough energy. I won't have enough contacts. Let me ask you, what are you lacking? What do you need more of? More time? More money? More energy? More knowledge? More opportunity? I want to challenge you to commit to the four daily habits of an overflowing life. Would you say right now, dear God, I, I will connect with you every day. I, I'm gonna be like the vine and the branch. I wanna bear fruit. I gotta stay connected. I gotta spend time with Jesus every day. Do prayer and meditation. There's not gonna be a day of my life that I don't spend some time with you. How can I have a relationship to God if I never spend any time with him? You say, I will connect. That's, I will do that habit of daily connecting with God. We have a class on it, class 201. Will you say, I'm gonna stop complaining and start being more grateful every day. Say, God, I, I, I wanna start every day with a list of 10, 12, 15 things. I just get up and start by being grateful, not grumpy. Grateful, not griping. Grateful, not complaining. And then say, God, I, I wanna develop this habit of stop comparing myself and start being contented. Stop comparing. Start being contented every day. Stop living my life for the approval of others, whether in the neighborhood, at school, or on the internet. Help me to be me, not somebody else. And God, I'm gonna stop being stingy and start being generous every day. Generous with my words of praise. Generous with my time, generous with my talent, generous with my, my treasure, generous in every area of my life. Maybe you need to say, I need to start tithing, Lord, just to trust you and your goodness. If you've never opened your life to Christ, say, Jesus Christ, I wanna learn to trust you. I'm tired of living an overwhelmed life. I wanna live an overflowing life. Help me to do it your way because you are a good God and you want what's best for me. And I pray this in your name, amen. Thanks for checking out this week's message on YouTube. We would love to get you connected with our online community. There's three easy ways to get you involved. First, learn about belonging to our church family by taking Class 101 online. Second, you can join an online small group or a local home group in your area. And third, check out our Facebook group to engage with our online community throughout the week. To take these next steps, visit saddleback.com slash online or shoot me an email at online at saddleback.com. I hope to hear from you soon.